Good morning, everybody. Respected Shri Shankar Narayan sir, Deputy Registrar, Administration, NIEPMD, Shri Chandrasekharan sir, the Zonal Committee Member of the Rehabilitation Council of India, South Zone, Madam Aloka Guha, Madam. All the participants who have joined for this national webinar that is CRE accredited by Rehabilitation Council of India on gender dimensions of disability in Indian context. I just want to give a brief uh, outlay. We all know that uh, disability issues have significant consequences on individual family and society. So we must ensure that people with disabilities are economically, socially, geographically, and under many aspects should be included. That is why we have all the laws which are pertaining to persons with disabilities. But very important that we should understand the impairment, the activity limitations, and the participation restrictions which are there, and which we are going to find out some solutions for an active participation. This three-day national CRE webinar is organized by NIEPMD and we are having very good resource persons from the field, very experienced resource persons from the field who will be addressing us and sharing their experiences. I want to inform to all the participants that at the end of each day, that is today, tomorrow and day after tomorrow, we will be having an evaluation of the presentations made by the resource persons. And the link will be shared in the chat box. So you have to click the link and you have to answer the questions based on 
your percentage that is you must ensure that you get 70 percentage and above to get dcre accreditation status and also for your upgradation of cre points so all the members all the participants have to ensure that they listen carefully the presentation made by the resource persons and be sure to have the attendance full because all your attendance are being calculated through the google excel worksheet and we will be knowing that who all have attended properly we have around more than 170 people participating so another inf information is while the resource person is speaking if you have any doubt put it in the chat box make sure that you do not present yourself because once the resource person is presenting then their presentation will get affected all this information we will be providing you time to time so that you get your cre credit points and in a day you have six points so altogether you will get 18 points but on the condition that you need to complete 70 percentage in your evaluation so now without taking much of the time i would request our respected sri sankar narayan sir deputy registrar administration nipmd for the inaugural speech and to declare this national cre webinar open <laughs> Very good morning to everyone and uh, it is a great pleasure to see around 120 people right now. It's going to increase uh, 190 to, uh, up to 90 to go and it's my pleasure to extend my sincere uh, thanks and very, very good morning to everyone. Uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar sir, who is uh, uh, journal Coordination Committee, Journal Coordinator for South Zone. I have pleasure in welcoming you, sir. Thanks for joining today. And I have pleasure in inviting Aloka Guha, madam. She is very closely associated with our institute. And uh, Sunita Seshadri, madam. And Maus, me Bhomik and Nubedita Patnaik and Ms. Renu Peter and Dr. Madhumadi, Dr. Sandhya Limaye and Chitra Shah and Ananta Lakshmi Madam and Anita Alexander and Meenakshi Balasubramanyam and Aishwarya Shaiyan. They are all very, very, very interesting to note. Very, very experienced people are also speaker and the youngsters also going to sh share their uh, experience with us in uh, three days. And when we talk about the topic, the general dimension in the has received increased attention that the COVID situation and uh, the rationale is that integrating sex and gender analysis enhances the quality of research and innovation and today topic is very very um, important topic at the present context so these kind of uh, issues normally if we have more challenges these kind of cha uh, topics need to be given more attention and uh, NIPMD is having pleasure in having this uh, three days national webinar on this topic. And I'm very, very happy to say this particular seminar, around 200 people are enrolled. And I would say it is a feather in our NIPMD cap that such a webinar is, uh, is conducted. We are uh, having opportunity to conduct such a uh, very large webinar and i know everyone is having challenge during covid situation and whether i would say this is advantage or disadvantage and 
around 200 people a kind of meditation a kind of group we are joining today and concentrating on a topic and it's a, again it's a great pleasure that though we are quite away in the distance because of this internet because of this meet we come very close while we are coming very close it is our duty to discuss a interesting topic i hope this general dimension of disability in indian context is going to be an interesting topic how to make more interest means if you have person with so much of experience if they share their knowledge with and the experience that going to be a bit boon to this uh, webinar once again and uh, one more thing i would like to share is this is a first seminar webinar of this academic year and we are going to have a serious sub seminar around 30 seminar and the participants 200 participants will be in each seminar and each topic going to be very very relevant to this and uh, it will it will also help rca professional to get their point and they had they can enhance their knowledge and, and the current scenario and once again i have pleasure in inviting all the participants uh -huh. it's not too and it is around 124 people right now they are connected it is really really excellent situation and i will not be a disturbance to you i will definitely go to the speaker to uh, enhance your um, knowledge on the topic at the same time and once again our uh, uh, nie pmd is committed to give quality program and quality CRE always. And with that, I have to extend my sincere gratitude to all Rajesh Ramachandran and his team who is continuously working on this and is extending a full support for conducting this webinar, especially in a smooth and very uh, grand manner. With this, I have once again inviting all the speakers. Now I request Mr. Chandrasekhar to bless this uh, gathering and uh, give a brief uh, address to the uh, participant. Thank you very much. Chandra Jai, sir, please. Sir, please. Uh, can you hear me? Ah, uh, you, you can hear, sir. Uh, very good morning, sir. Mm. I am very glad to know that NIPMED is organizing the webinar for three days on the title Gen Gender Dimension, Dimensions of Disability in the Indian Context. My best wishes for successful conduct of the webinar. I extend my sincere thanks and gratitude to the director of NIPMED and C. S. Sankaranaranji, Deputy Director. Deputy Registrar, NIPMAT. I extend my sincere thanks and gratitude to the following resource persons. Uh, Mr. Alok Kakuha, former chairperson, National Trust, Kolkata. Dr. Sunita Seshatri, Deputy Director, NIPCCD, Regional Centre, Mohali, in morning session for their support and uh, guidance. I also congratulate the participants of the CRE program. Once again, on behalf of RCA, I thank everyone of the particip participants. Once again, thank Director of NIPMED and uh, Deputy Director of uh, uh, Sankarana Rayanji and uh, Senior Consultant Dr. R. Manikhandanji. Thank you, Ji. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Chandrasekharan, sir, and thank you so much, uh, Shankar Narayan, sir, for motivating us. And every time you are behind us and supporting us with your valuable commitment, knowledge, and experience, and we are really grateful to all of you, sir. Also, would like to thank Director Pachiketa Raut, sir, for permitting us to conduct this program. Thank you very much, sir. Shantani, can we have the first slide? 
I would request the other participants to kindly mute. Thank you, one and all. With the permission of Deputy Director Sir, Sankarnarayan Sir, and Chandrasekharan Sir, it's my pleasure and honor to invite a very prestigious, a very knowledgeable, and very academically oriented resource person. We all know her very well. We have been seeing all through offline, online mode, on the desk, on the dais, working for the rehabilitation and empowerment of persons with disabilities, the one and only, having more than 40 years of experience working in the civil society organization, in intellectual disabilities, cerebral palsy, multiple disabilities. Those who have been in Chennai, they must have known that she was the founder director of the Spastic Society of Tamil Nadu. We all know her as the founder chairperson of the National Trust for the Welfare of Persons with Autism, Cerebral Palsy, Mental Retardation and Multiple Disabilities. She was the controller of examinations for the Rehabilitation Council of India under the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment, Government of India. Prior to that, Madam was the technical officer for Mental Health and Substance Abuse Unit under World Health Organization, Southeast Asia Regional Office, New Delhi. She had initiated various programs, various projects related to cerebral palsy, intellectual disabilities, autism, she had represented Government of India in the elaboration of the UN Convention of Disability several times at the UN headquarters in New York, prepared the Indian draft and submitted to the UN in the year 2003 and also participated in the preparation of the harmonized draft of the UN CRPD in New York. It's really a great pleasure and uh, we are really fortunate to have Madam Aloka Guha with us, who will be sharing her thoughts and also will be enlightening and also will be giving us the way to start this three-day national CRE webinar on gender dimensions of disability in the Indian context. Thank you so much. Shantani, you can invite now Aloka ma'am. So good morning and warm welcome everyone to the national webinar on gender dimensions of disability in Indian context hosted by NIAPMD. So before we start the session, a kind request to all the participants once again to mute your mics and if you have any questions in the, during the session, you can put it in the chat box or we can uh, discuss in the end of every session uh, during Q&A session. So without taking much ado, let me welcome Madam Aloka Goha, former chairperson, National Trust consultant on disability. Uh, welcome, ma'am. We are honored by your presence and uh, over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, uh, Nitmed. Vanakam, uh, Namaskaram, good morning. Uh, I hope everybody is keeping well during this. Uh, pan pandemic here. Uh, I'm going to uh, start my presentation now. May I uh, share? Yeah, okay. So I'm going to be using my entire screen for the presentation. So uh, if there are comments in the chat box, please, uh, you will have to answer later on, tell me about them. Can, can you see my slides? No, it's not visible. Not visible? OK, then I'll have to start again. OK. Uh, let me present again. 
share um, now this one ma'am is it you can see the presentation now yes ma'am yes, yes ma'am okay great it's not yes, visible now thank you thank you thank you nitmet thank you everybody for inviting me to do this presentation uh, it's a bit of a complicated topic and it is only an analysis of i'm not going to be presenting all of this but i'm presenting the analysis of political roots and social psychological and emotional dimensions of gender disablement from a feminist perspective so these are issues today that i'm going to discuss which are both a cause and a consequence of the above topic uh, but first uh, since this is the first presentation i'm doing on gender after the afghan crisis i have shown a picture of Af afghan women and i express my solidarity with all of them and if any of you feel that yes you are also wanting to express your solidarity with afghan women who are facing uh, certain difficulties in their country please put that in the chat box so having said that let me move on to what the feminist perspective is and i show here a picture of simone the vivia her fabulous fabulous book called the second sense sex is she's originator of the sex gender dichotomy just because you're born a female doesn't give you the gender dimension so let's learn to understand the difference between sex and gender and this is pivotal to feminize feminist theorizing in the 1970s uh, which started well before that through simone and her famous sentence is one is not born but rather becomes a woman so you are born a female but you become a wom woman and you become the gender of a wo woman you take that role on so uh, before i begin this is what i want to establish the difference between being uh, a female and being a woman the difference being uh, between having uh, the female sex and having the female gender so let me my in my next slide i am showing you the four waves now feminism is feminism is not a monolithic ideology or a perspective or a movement it's it's sort of grown like everything else in life the feminist movement has waves and i'm showing here the different waves and the primary focus in the context of the united states the first wave was in the 19th and early 20th century which talked about women's suffrage basically right to vote basic legal rights such as property ownership that was the focus at that time in the second wave of feminism 1960s to 1980s there's a range of issues particularly about violence against women reproductive health equal rights amendment to existing legislation and formulation of equity legislation and this established various women centered organizations such as feminist health corners sexual assault centers domestic violence shelters women's bookstores women's credit unions and women's art spaces so much of this is still relevant in terms of sexual assault in terms of women's health domestic violence all of these are still relevant and that fight goes on so it's not as if they stopped fighting for one thing and continued with the other except for the women's suffrage part but largely new ideas and new focus came into the feminist movement the third wave 1990s to 2010 talked largely about individual self expression and the promotion of diversity and the sex positive initiatives in this concept of diversity we didn't see too much of 
disability as a diversity. It was in the fourth wave, 2013 to the present time, where the concept of intersectionality, intersectionality talks, and this was really started by Kimberley Crenshaw, and she wasn't speaking initially of, of disability, she was speaking of black women and their movement. So this intersectionality came because there was a lot of debate and discussion about women who are at the crossroads of several disadvantages and several difficulties, not just being a woman, but being a woman of black color, being a woman with disability, being a woman from a poverty situation, in women with different classes, poorer class, upper class, middle class, and in India, women from different castes. So intersectionality, which is actually the basis of the entire CRE program today, only started very late in the feminist movement. And it included later on reproductive rights, violence against women, especially sexual harassment through the Me Too movement, which is still very, very strong across the world, and the strategic use of social media as a tool of feminist education. So the pandemic has forced us to use much more social media than we were doing now, and it has helped the feminist movement as well as the disability movement. Sorry, I'm not able, trying to move my slide. So let me let me define the intersectionalities that I have been given today. Multiple intersectionalities, multiple layerings, multiple dimensions, dichotomies, and disadvantages. The first is gender. Gender as a relationship between sexes in societies is usually seen as operating hierarchically. Men more powerful and dominant, women less powerful, weaker. And these produce stereotypes of masculinity and femininity. And then there are role expectations from these stereotypes of women being the nurturer, men being the breadwinner, and so on. And they have culturally defined, approved ways to perform these gender roles and culturally appropriate contextual to each country, to each nation. So gender is commonly defined as the socially constructed identities, behaviors, and practices tied to being a girl or a woman. So this is what Simone Bouvier was saying that one is not born into that gender, but grows into it. And you, the de definition of gender that I am setting for this conference is not just being having the female sex, but also having uh, certain culturally defined roles and expectations. In terms of disability, this is the intersectionality of being gender, a woman, and having disability. So gender intersectionality and inclusion came into the women's movement later on, as I explained earlier. And this movement is about confronting hierarchies and inequalities among members. This stem from mainstream norms and social practices. So when women fight for these, women with disability fight for these, uh, want to break away from the pre-designed and pre-assigned mainstream norms, those are the fight for the intersectionality. And this has led, when women with, women with disability, fighting against men with disabilities on one hand, fighting against the society against, on the other hand, and even within the feminist movement, they had to have new gender movement politics, which included women with disabilities and women with other disadvantages as well. So the original binary definition of gender, male and female, of course, is no longer valid because now we have LGBT, we have intersexes, uh, we have different kinds of gender introduced here. 
and the social emotional psychological discriminations deeper discrimination that they face in the social realm these sociological accounts of gender disability what did they do they stress the systemic nature of the social order and its reinforcement of very powerful social institutions for disability these this is the medical profession the most central institution remains those associated with the medical profession with rehabilitation and social support and other institutions then they start repeating that same pattern of gender discrimination that goes into education employment transport etc and someone else i think moshimi will be discussing that so i won't go into that detail but the most potent patterns of discrimination is in the access to and use of public spaces let me start with the historical roots how did all of this happen why are women lower in everyone's expectation why is there a sense of shame in being a woman why is there a difficulty in being a person with disability so this is how it started in ancient era in greece in roman times also people with disabilities had no right to life they were exposed in in the wilderness they were left behind in forests they were thrown away from the top of the mountain so that they would die so exposing young children with severe disabilities was a common practice in ancient greece they had to be killed the ancient era also idealized physical and mental perfection so anybody who was different like people with disabilities was viewed as a mark of inferiority so there was a lot of shame they were they were kept hidden if they survived and they were considered inferior someone as well known as aristotle the philosopher in his politics aristotle wrote as to the exposure and rearing of children let there be a law that no deformed child shall live again reinforcing the need to get rid of them to death and he interestingly also wrote and this is before christ 382 322 before christ he also wrote that man man was the most highly evolved being and that woman was one giant evolutionary step below men and they were representing the first step along the road to deformity so these are the historical roots that they were left to die they had no right to life they were considered inferior people with disabilities were considered inferior and a woman with disability was one giant evolutionary step below men so this is the beginning and of course then the when uh, with the middle ages the principles of christianity the scripture in the old testament linked sin against god with chronic illness and disability and to reference people with disabilities is found in many times and they were called unclean and because he is unclean he cannot be a priest and he cannot even approach the altar he cannot enter into the home so the top 5 terms and their frequency of use in the bible blind was mentioned 93 times 6 88 times and so on so the notion that a person's disability can be healed if he or she has faith in god and repents of his or her sins this was cited many times and christ was seen to be very kind to Uh, people who were weaker more disadvantaged and there were many miracles associated with his healing and look at this one he says i have healed you go and sin no more implying or at least interpreted as sinning had caused so 
influence of religion was across the world. Charitable institutions started coming up, monasteries started looking after people with disabilities, and it was seen to be kind to people with disabilities. So it was changing, but this was not a seamless kind of change. But karma or actions became the sole reason behind any kind of disability, deformity, or deviance from normal behavior. So this is seen in all cultures. In the Quran also, 47, 23 says, such are the men whom Allah has cursed, for he has made them deaf and blinded their sight. In Indian heritage, some efforts were made so that persons with disabilities became contributing members of society. There are rock edicts of King Ashoka and the zakat system in the reign of Akbar, where there was some kind the kindness shown to people with disabilities. And Chandragupta Maurya uh, was, uh, in his reign, uh, it was seen that Chanakya uh, had actually ordered that no bad terms should be used, so no negativity should surround people with disabilities, and that they should be given work according to their ability. So it seems as if the handicapped were well cared for in the history of India, although our mythology there is always um, Shakuni and Mantra, uh, people with disabilities who were seen to have negative uh, connotations. Then came a time when people with disabilities were meant to entertain by joking and clowning. Also, they were meant to entertain because they were locked up in institutions. And the general public would actually pay money buy tickets to go and see them screaming, shouting, behaving differently. They were kept in monasteries and in institutions, and they were locked up, particularly for people who were found to be mentally ill or mentally retarded. Look at the chains that these people have around them. The picture in the center shows you a person who has marks on his face. So these are people with leprosy. If they were coming down the road, they had to come with a bell and ring the bell loudly so that everybody in the road moves away from the person with leprosy. So these are forms of discrimination, of, of negligence, of um, absolute extremes of shutting them out of society, exclusion, not inclusion. And then Edward Seguin came with his young and influential doctor. He, he said that mental deficiency was caused by a weakness of the nervous system and could be cured through process of motor and sensory training. Many of his thoughts are still relevant today. And he made a big change. He created larger institutions. The better off people had a uh, good quality, few people in those institutions, but the poorer ones were stored, were <laughs> stored, I use the word stored because that's how they were kept. Uh, there was no therapy, of course, but they were uh, given food, shelter, and uh, clothing of some kind. But vocational training started mm -hmm. because of a belief that these are people who had difficulty, not, not demons. Then the Renaissance period started its own own study of the human body. Doctors were again allowed to dissect people, find out what's happening. And then started this whole business of sterilization of people with mental retardation, mental illness, and epilepsy. So across the world, feeble-minded were called imbeciles. And having epilepsy, they were forbidden to marry or to have sexual relationships. So this is a continuing process of discrimination of anybody who were different. But the world was. They brought the professional therapies, not for disabled people primarily, but for soldiers who came back from war uh, without limbs, without sight, without hearing, and with minds that needed healing and support. So all of the professional therapies of physical therapy, speech therapy, 
occupational therapy and all of the prosthetics, orthotics, all of these were institutionalized after the world wars. And I want to share with you just this one slide. The, the origin of the word handicapped, uh, because people with disabilities were perennially termed as being poor also. They were termed together, the poor and the handicapped. So what there were poor laws, which included people with disabilities, and they were begging. So they had their caps in their hand, put it out for getting money from people, and then the word And we are not able to hear you. You're on mute, ma'am. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes, ma yes, ma now over here. The audible. Yes, ma'am. So, how many slides did you miss? Hello. Two slides, I think. Okay. There's a lot of background noise that I can hear. Can you please ask everybody to be muted? The last two slides we missed. Uh, the one with the handicap and the one with the professional training? Yes. Yeah. yes this yes. is the World War One, where professional therapies came in for soldiers, but also benefited people with disabilities, both men and women. And this was because of being compelled to suffer the indignity of being poor, always considered, because a lot of them were beggars. And this is where the word handicap came in with the, because they were standing at crossroads and on roads with their caps out to beg. And they had their hands and the cap, and it was called handicap. So the terminology reflects the attitudinal change towards people with disability. Now we say person with intellectual disability or person with multiple disabilities. The Nazis were another very, very big factor. They sterilized 663,000 people in six years. The role of the UN actually changed a lot of this. Can you hear me? Yes, 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 yes ma'am. But in between, somebody is speaking. I, I hope you can tell them to stop. So the role of the U, UN, United Nations, They brought in the International Bill of Human Rights in 1948, the United Nations Bill, the first one on which in 1948, our own constitution was based on that very famous bill. And they brought in the understanding of impairment, disability, handicap. They brought in CBR. They brought in the International Year of the Disabled. And later on, ICF, which is a different understanding of disability through participation and restriction. And CEDAW for women, which doesn't have anything on disabled women, but CRC 1989 does have a section on children with disabilities. And finally came UNCRPD, United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, where the right to life is established through Article 10. So this has been a long and difficult journey. And SDG 5, which on gender equality and empowering women and girls. So from, the, from a journey from the political and historical roots of being killed, not allowed to survive, not allowed to live, to coming to the sustainable develop goal, development goals, which are both gender inclusive and disability inclusive, this has been a long, long journey. And the changed paradigm on disability is again through the United Nations. So other things that resulted as came through as a result of changed attitude is that we moved away from the medical model 
to the social model. And what is that? The, the medical model is where you look at the disability or the person with disability as the problem. And the social model is where the societal barriers create the disability. So this movement of different approaches. And now after the CRPD, we are talking about the human rights model that uh, these are all new additions to different approaches to persons with disabilities in general, both men and women. And of course, this is the movement of people with disabilities, which included a large number of women. And I want to mention Jenny Hatch, who was a woman with Down syndrome in Virginia. She won a lawsuit against her parents because her parents were forcing her to live in a residential care home and she didn't want to live there. She actually won that case. And this whole debate of nothing about us without us, that is towards the end of the journey. And I show here Yukiko Nakanishi, who was one of the founders of the independent living movement for persons with certain types of disabilities. UNCRPD has Article 6 on women with disabilities. And remember, this has been signed and ratified, not only the main convention, but also its optional protocol. India has never signed the optional protocol of any of the human rights treaties, and we haven't done this for disability either. But many, many countries, as I showed you, the ones with the red, red one are the ratified convention and protocol, whereas the dark blue ones who are ratified, obviously signed and ratified, but the light blue ones, which are very few, have only signed the convention and the protocol, not ratified them yet. So large number of countries have ratified and signed the CRPD, of which Article 6 is on women with disabilities. So this is a long journey from shame, ridicule, sterilization to entertainment, dependence. Now, dependence is another part which still continues with women with disabilities, charity, beggary, discrimination. Then movement towards self-determination, independent living, and inclusion in the community. And this journey has been up and down and up and down. And what has made it possible is education. So the most well-known slogans of the US women's movement when they say personal is political. So this is also where our disability paradigms shifted. The women felt they were the experts about their issues, not others, not men. So this dem demystification of knowledge that women are experts in their own line, this is a parallel with the situation of disability where people with disabilities feel that they are the experts about their own lives and not necessarily the medical professionals or the rehabilitation professionals. So let me come to the India story now. Uh, unlike many other Western, sorry, what happened? Unlike many other Western countries, India's population of women, even within the disability sector, is less, is lower than the population of males, except in the visual area and in the hearing area. In all other disability areas, women have a lower, this is a variety of reasons we all know, female feticide, etc. But there are fewer women than men with disabilities in India. And a lot of them live in rural areas. So inclusivity and intersectionality. This is the main topic. Feminist movement, as I said, there's not been a single factor of subordination and oppression. There have been many factors, but not enough attention has been given to women of different race, different class, different sexual identity, or different 
disabilities or to age and other dimensions. So we now need to make a few points here. First, the gender and disability combine to form some of the most severe forms of marginalization and discrimination. Second, women with disabilities face exclusion from education and employment and are at higher risk of violence, neglect, and poverty than women without disabilities. So women with disabilities have been described as being doubly marginalized. They are more vulnerable to poverty and social exclusion, and often have limited social, political, and economic opportunities, and certainly lack of access to basic services. And all of you who run services would know that largely you will see more men, boys, coming for services than women. But the most important point here I want to make is number five, that women with disabilities, greater risk of sexual and physical violence and abuse. So intersectionality came in to the African gender movement, and it has now gone everywhere. They use the slogan, without feminism, there is no socialism. So the intersectionality concept, which Jessica Horn writes about, talks about a conceptual framework that makes visible the multiple discriminations that people face, the ways in which systems of oppression continue to build one on another, and they challenge the multiple inequalities for seeking justice for different constituencies of women. There are women with disabilities, there are women of color, there are women of different class, there are women of uh, rural areas, there are women of different occupations, and in India, there are women of different castes, and they have their own set of challenges, own multiple inequalities they face, not only from men, but also from other women. So Anita Ghai, whose books I have read and enjoy thoroughly, seven things from her that I want to quote. First, disability rights itself has not been respected. So how do you expect that a women's movement in India was equally exclusionary in acknowledging disability as a critical marginal category. She also says, the predicament of women with disabilities is made more complex by the fact that they're simply not regarded as women. Historically, too, able-bodied society has failed to recognize the different experiences of disabled women, assuming that women with disabilities do not have to deal with the same oppressions that non-disabled women confront in terms of, say, class, etc., primarily because disabled women are not seen as women in a heteronormative, able-bodied society. They're not even seen as persons. And this holds for anyone who is different from the ideal form. So from right from childhood, disability imposes a subordinate status on women with disabilities and increases the likelihood of denial of rights. And in the Indian context, for example, even in the Asian context, where being a girl is considered a curse, and being a disabled girl is a fate considered worse than death, carrying the burdens of gender and disability. So there are differences that Helen Nikosha talks about, not only with women who are disabled and women who are not disabled, but also among people with disabilities who are men and who are women. So they don't find spouses who care for them. And whatever so far the double disadvantage has done for them is just a little bit within tokenism and rhetoric. And the most important word I want you to remember from here, that though couched in politically correct language, disabled women are still an afterthought in the gender movement. And this feminist oversight is not very different from the patriarchal 
studies, attitudes, and approaches that we see when men determine the agenda. So they are they feel out out excluded not only from the men's agenda, from the disability agenda, but also from other women in the feminist agenda. So gender movement and social movements, as I said, Jessica Horn, 2013, if you have this material access to and access to Anita Bhai's book on disabled women and excluded agenda of Indian feminism, these two are worth reading. I mentioned them in the reference, and you should, all of them, look and read these books, where multiple marginalizations have sh has shaped their political roots and made them psychologically, socially, emotionally more vulnerable. And that vulnerability that women with disabilities feel through these exclusionary approaches is what shapes their agenda. I also want you to read this book. It's phone. Huh? It's phone. The Status of Blind Women in India in December 2000. This was actually edited, I think, by Anuradha Mohit. And they talk about their personal image, levels of self-esteem as regards beauty. And they think it's their complexion, largely, or their physical being, their features, and what others say make them feel low. So the major findings at a glance in that study, in that report, says that blind family income, their economic status is below 2,000. 72% of them say that. The personal income is below 1,000. 54% of blind women said that. In employment, 99% are unemployed. Only 1% are employed. And the rate of education is 1% education, 99% uneducated. So this is the situation of women with disabilities. And in India, this is compounded by poverty and by rurality. Look at this picture of this mother. And this is a girl. She wears, the only way you know she's a girl is because the mother has put, given a little chain on her neck. The mother has some milk to spare. And she feeds it to the calf and not to her disabled child. She doesn't think that the disabled girl has any future, but the calves do. And this is a picture of women, blind women, going to college and universities. But rural women don't get that opportunity. And the poverty isolates them further. So poverty and disability are both a cause and a consequence of each other. So there is also an intra-disability differential access in girls. Those with hearing impairment, those with visual impairment, fare much better in Indian society than women with intellectual and psychiatric difficulties. There's also a digital divide that I want to talk to, although I'm showing you a picture of a girl using a computer, but more boys with disabilities have access. This is a study that came out uh, from uh, Karnataka. So all of these are pictures and realities of women who face psychological social and emotional discrimination, particularly those who have intellectual and psychiatric difficulties. At the same time, in 2021, in August 18, the Kerala High Court allowed medical termination of pregnancy of a woman with mental retardation way beyond the permitted limit because it was a question of survival of both the child and the mother. The psychological status of women with disabilities in India, they're far more at greater risk of psychosocial health problems, higher rates of unipolar depression and stress. Many, by and large, they say many people with disabilities, both men and women, are at higher risk for comorbidities in terms of uh, psychiatric disorders, but women are four times the odds of experiencing sexual assault in the last year as compared to women without disabilities. And women with disabilities have high, higher rates of psychosocial 
disorders than men with disabilities. So six issues I'm going to discuss. One is the question of female feticide, discrimination before birth, particularly in low resource countries, then family discrimination. You can see this picture. These were born as twins in a low resource family. Whatever they had, they gave to the boy. And look at the status of the girl. Highly undernourished, developed a disability because of nutritional factors. So there's discrimination at, before, at birth. Sometimes before birth, some people find out that this is a girl and they abort the girl. Then they find family discrimination and access to justice is very difficult for women with disabilities, particularly those who have intellectual disabilities. They're put away in residential care and or in families where all decisions are taken by the family on their behalf. Their legal capacity is not recognized and they have no way of challenging the decisions that are taken on their behalf because the very absence of competence leaves them powerless to initiate any such changes so they have no legal capacity no even though the rights of persons with disabilities is now in place this has not yet been seen on the ground so access to justice family discrimination and female feticide are the six issues that I'm talk uh, three of the six issues I'm talking about, which are a result of the ongoing psychological, social, and emotional discrimination that they have failed. So the three issues, other are, are invisibility. <laughs> In fact, Bhai talks about structural amnesia, about the particular concerns of roughly 35 million disabled women whom it often renders invisible. So in that hierarchy of needs within the feminist movement or within the disability movement, women with disabilities are lost, become invisible in both agendas. Their mental health is far more, the increased risk for anxiety, low self-esteem, fear rejection, bullying, especially those who have specific learning disabilities in a study on in the school area, they found 31% more likely to have been bullied and other studies on the mental health issues show 43% times more likely than students without disabilities to experience levels of bullying. So apparently in India, one in three persons in the community constitute a serious public health problem. So invisibility, mental health, and sexual and viol physical violence, which my our next speaker will speak about, but I will mention this as an issue when I analyzed the uh, psychosocial emotional uh, discrimination faced by women with disabilities. So sometimes they are considered to be asexual. Uh, they don't have any sexual needs. In fact, I remember a student that I was teaching in a B.Ed. course in, in Kolkata. She had a disability and she cried and cried and cried because uh, she wanted to put on some bangles and when she came out with the bangles from her house, people in the mohalla in the community said, Apna chahera dekha hai shisha mein? She's trying to be beautiful by wearing bangles. She ran away from that house and she cried and cried. She had actually, the community felt that she had no right to look beautiful, that she doesn't have uh, the, because she's a disabled woman. And their reproductive and sexual health is often not taken care of. And the large number of abuse is by the family. And when a girl complains, and if you read Anita Ghai's books, you'll see many, many references to these stories across the country. When a girl with disability complains to her mother that someone is touching her inappropriately, an uncle or so, the mother doesn't understand or pretends not to understand are they running short of girls why will they look at you why will they do anything to you so she doesn't feel trusted and therefore she does not seek justice she just endures and a lot of this is partner violence as well as family abuse i remember about trafficking 
there are some countries like Thailand, which like, which want deaf girls to be part of the prostitution racket because they cannot speak their difficulties out. They cannot fight for justice. So the physical and sexual assault of women with disability continue unabated. So 2013, and I want to make a special point of this, that women with certain disabilities like intellectual and psychosocial difficulties, they are at greater risk of abuse. They are locked away in unhygienic, unhealthy institutions. And there are two pictures here where these women are at the end of their tether. They can no longer face life. They're locked up forever. Or they are in certain institutions which dress them up and market their misery, girls with disabilities. So this report, Human Rights Watch, it's a report by Shantarao Bariga and Keith Sharma. It's a 106-page report in 2013 about institutions, uh, which are lifelong institutions. And they talk about overcrowding, forced treatment, including electroconvulsive therapy, and a lot of physical, verbal, and sexual abuse. So these are multiple barriers that prevent women and girls with psychosocial or intellectual disabilities from reporting abuses and accessing justice because nobody believes them and they may not have the competence to report that clearly and effectively. Although in the RPWD Act, Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act, Section 4 and 5, there's a special focus on girls and women with disabilities so that they enjoy their rights equally with others, that support is given to women with disability for a livelihood and for upbringing of their children. And I remember this upbringing of their children was added by the then minister, uh, Meera Kumarji, who later became the speaker. And they have a right to live in the community. They're not obliged to live in any particular arrangement fixed by others and their protection of reproductive rights. As we all know, hysterectomies are continuously being conducted on women with intellectual and psychological difficulties. So what rights are we talking about here? And in my last few slides, I'm talking about the synergy between SDG 4, education, and 5, women or gender and the RPWD and the NEP together, RPWD being Rights of Persons with Disabilities and NEP being the National Education Policy. So here we have at 4.5 of the SDG, eliminate gender disparities. And this comes in section 6.7 and 8 of the NEP. And in RPD, it comes in 4.1. Similarly, 5.6, sexual and reproductive health, in RPWD, it comes in Section 4 and in Section 5. And the rest is about education. So it's interesting that a lot of studies have been done where CEDA, which is uh, the Convention Against Elimination Against Discrimination of Women, and the CRPD and CRD, CRC, have actually got studies done and looked at where they converge. So these intersectional human rights, which are platforms of action, they show that certain rights are indivisible. The right to life gives you right to education, right to health, right to freedom from abuse, torture, harassment. So the civil, political, cultural, economic, and social rights are interrelated and indivisible, whether they are in CEDA or CRPD or CRC. The three major global organizations that I want to talk about before I finish. First is He for She. It started in September 2014. Small movements in communities together became a big movement. He for She. And it had President Obama and the UN Secretary Ban Ki-moon as their advocates, where they used boys and men to be advocates of the gender cause. And then the second one was the Global Goals, September 2015. We know this is the SDG. 
And the third one is the girl effect, where 250 million girls living in poverty between 2030, by 2013, is going to be doing so by five different aspects of a girl's life, education, health, economic security, safety, voice and rights. Now, this is the last bit is a new one, voice and rights. This we have not talked about in our earlier agenda, either in feminism or in disability. And this is supported largely by Nike. So SDG goal I've talked about. Unfortunately, some of the gains that were being made because of SDG 5, achieving gender equality and empowering all women and girls, including disabled girls, this has had a setback because of the pandemic. And the effects of COVID-19 could reverse the limited progress that has been made on gender equality and women's rights. And the coronavirus outbreak is exacerbates existing inequalities for women and girls across every sphere from health and economy, security, social protection, everything. Women play a disproportionate role in responding to the virus, including as frontline healthcare workers and as carers at home. And this has, pandemic has also led to a steep increase in violence against women and girls when they are with their purpose Predators, they are locked up and trapped at home with their abusers, struggling to access services that are being cut. Particularly domestic violence has intensified. So United Nations head has said, limited gains in gender equality and women's rights made over decades are now in danger of being rolled back due to the COVID-19 pandemic. He's urged governments to put women and girls at the center of their recovery efforts. Why? Because women are not only the hardest hit by the pandemic, but also they are the backbone of the recovery process. Look at the burden that women, including women with disabilities, face because of the pandemic. They are losing what they had. But there are many women who have overcome these challenges, the psychological, social, emotional discrimination, difficulties, and disadvantages that they have faced. I've put Anita Ghai, who talked about gendered politics. She's a professor, a very well-known professor. She's written many books. And she talks about structural amnesia when it comes to women with disabilities. And there's Jija Ghosh who is a very bright student from Presidency College, Calcutta. She has many, many qualifications. When she want, with difficulty, she found a life partner. But when she wanted to adopt a child, the district child protection officer in Odisha, who has a postgraduate in psychology, she felt that Jija she equated cerebral palsy with Jija has with mental illness. And she said that, how can I let you adopt a child because you may turn violent and harm the child? This is society, even as we face it today. But she was, remember, she was forcibly deboarded from a flight that she was taking to go and attend a, a national conference. And she fought a case against uh, the airlines, won that case. But at the end, the DGCA guidelines were changed for women with disabilities. And then there's Anjali Agarwal. She is a member of the Standing Committee in Niti Aayog, Government of India. She works as a coordinator for the Sustainable Development Goals for Women. She has done a lot of things in accessibility, walkability, road safety audits, etc. Then there's Anuradha Mohit, who is recently retired as the director of NIPID. Before that, she was director of NIPVID a very successful woman, a very human rights advocate. Then there are two IAS officers, a blind woman, the first blind lady with uh, who is an IAS, Pinjal Pranjal Patil, and of course, Ira Singhal, who topped the civil services exams. And at the end, I show you my friend, Yukiko Nakanishi, who was the founder of the independent living movement in Japan. And these are my references. 
I come to the end, and I want to thank everybody for listening to me um, very quietly, gently, if you have any questions. And if I have the answers to that, I will certainly respond. But please put in your chat box what uh, uh, you felt about my presentation. And if there are questions that you have uh, that I can answer, I will be very happy to do so. For the most thank you, ma'am. So, I request the participants so if you have any questions, you can put it in the chat box so you can ask the madam. Yeah, participants, if you have any questions, you can put it in the chat box. Thank you, Don't say thank you, ma'am. Yes, tell me why you are thanking me. Yes, Lakshmi, go ahead. Uh, valuable information, uh, updating. Uh, thank you for updating me. Because if I you don't, not... if no, you don't uh, ask me questions, I will ask you questions. Don't say thank you, Akhil. Tell me why you are saying thank you. Have I given you information that you didn't know? Because I am not working now. So You're not working now. Okay. What about the others? Shiny. Rajesh, do you have a question? Or can I ask you a question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, madam. Uh, first of all, really very sorry, ma'am, to put you in such a situation wherein uh, actually we wanted you to start this. Uh, uh, webinar and uh, give a wave for all of us so that you know we go one by one and then cover all the points because uh, this is really a new topic for uh, all of us. Nobody has, uh, I have never seen CRE on this topic, but we thought it will be apt if we take this topic and we come up with some material so that uh, we can send it to RCA and then they can have more discussion, more programs on this. So. Uh, First of all, uh, the uh, name came, your name only came to my mind that you can start the uh, session and then we can build upon it. So did I do justice? <laughs> yes, sir, it was it was really eye opener and many things uh, we, we, we came to know about many things. Though we had heard about uh, uh, all other issues with related to Indian context, but there was many of the things that we came to know and uh, Yes, ma'am. I cannot say justice, ma'am, because you are more experienced, more well-versed, and you have been representing India in the World Forum. So I think this is the best uh, which I have, I have heard. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. Some people have raised hands. Could you please uh, coordinate that? Angela Francis, Hemant Varma, and six more have raised hands. Shantani, can you, uh, can you check and can you start the question and answer session with madam? Yes, sir. So, so far, there is I'm no. I am seeing, no, I'm seeing uh, Angela Francis, Hemant Verma, and a uh, few more who have raised hands. Whether they want to ask any question or. Uh, because they have to ask question because at the end of the day, we will be compiling all the information from all the resource persons and then we will be putting up for evaluation so we should not Sir, miss any can of the we, uh, will we get the uh, copy of the presentation yes yes you will get the copy of the presentation okay thank you but not today. okay because the information was uh, a lot and it was uh, you know very new information so i just wanted to have a copy of that so that yes I yes, yes definitely all all the information all things we will compile and give it to you okay sir. but for today's session for today's uh, for evaluation you have to remember what all have been okay. said by madam okay, at the end of the day So if there are men in this, say Satish, I can see Satish Shinde. So can you tell me what you think about 
intersectionality. Do women with disabilities, should women with disabilities have the same rights as men with disabilities and the same rights as women without disabilities? Please answer, sir. Madam is asking something. हेलो मैम यस सतीश थोड़ा हिंदी में बात होता था तो थोड़ा समझ में आता है हाँ मैं तो हिंदी में बोल दूंगी मगर फिर राजेश कंप्लेन करेगा क्योंकि वो साउथ इंडिया में हो रहा है मद्रास में तो मैं आपको ये पूछना चाहती हूँ कि जो डिसेबल वुमेन हैं क्या उनके अधिकार जो डिसेबल मेन है उनके अधिकार के समान होने चाहिए मैडम ऐसा कोई शिकायत नहीं गुड मॉर्निंग मैडम ऐसा कोई शिकायत नहीं करेगा एंड यू कैन मिक्स बोथ हिंदी एंड दिस इज नेशनल सेमिनार पीपल फ्रॉम थ्रो आउट इंडिया दे आर अटेंडिंग एंड आई विल नॉट रिक्वेस्ट इवन दो आई एम साउथ इंडियन हम हिंदी में ही बात करो ऐसा कुछ बोलेगा नहीं इंग्लिश में बात करो दो मिक्स करके बात करेगा तो सबको फायदा होगा मैडम हाँ सतीश जी मैंने आपसे पूछा कि जो डिसेबल्ड वेमेन है क्या उनके अधिकार डिसेबल्ड मेन के समान होने चाहिए नहीं नहीं वुमेन को ज्यादा अधिकार होने चाहिए बिकॉज वो उनको बहुत ये होता है उनको बहुत तकलीफ होती है और हमारे हिंदुस्तान में इसके लिए संविधान में संसद में न्यू uh, बिल uh, पास होना चाहिए बहुत चीजें हैं हमारे हिंदुस्तान में करने हैं और डिसेबल वुमन डिसेबल मैन इनके लिए लेकिन नहीं हो रहा है क्या आप समझते हैं कि डिसेबल्ड वेमेन एंड वेमेन विदाउट डिसेबिलिटी इनके अधिकार समान होने चाहिए <coughs> नहीं नहीं वो तो डिफरेंट रहेगा ना क्यों डिसेबल वुमन और नहीं नहीं डिसेबल वुमन और नॉर्मल वुमन ना उनके अधिकार अलग होने चाहिए क्या नहीं नहीं अधिकार अलग नहीं होने चाहिए अधिकार चाहिए सबको समान चाहिए समान चाहिए मगर है क्या आ, नहीं है अभी इतना ज्यादा नहीं है हेमंत वेर इज हेमंत वर्मा हेमंत आप कहाँ पे हैं? यू हैव रेज हैंड हेमंत वर्मा हु आर द पीपल हु रेज हैंड राजेश मैडम सुहारा पी के हेमंत रश्मि आर रेनी वल्ला चंद्रकांत सुधा अपर्णा सो दे हैव ऑल रेज हैंड्स मैम मैम कैन कैन आई आई टॉक टॉक यस कोई सवाल हो तो आप डायरेक्टली पूछ सकते हैं मैडम से प्लीज यू नो Uh, some system where she can be made sexually unreproductive yeah. because he was very much uh, you know he was all alone he goes to the office and he is very much uh, worried about the girl what uh, would happen to her yeah. and uh, you know i've i've come across uh, some uh, economically weaker sections also in that they don't uh, Uh, care about the girls mm. like the these things don't come to their mind actually mm. they are more of uh, involved in making their both hands meet all day uh, but with education with uh, you know opening their eyes these things can be uh, put into their mind that these things are important because a girl is all alone she cannot protect herself and uh, these things need to be done and uh, once they come into the reproductive age 
So what could be done, ma'am, in this case? Uh, I'm going to tell you something that actually happened. When I was in the National Trust, uh, at that time, our office was in the IPH building uh, in Deen Dayal Upadhyay Marg in Delhi. And one day, this man came in a very from a very poor background, a very elderly kind of person. He came in with this girl who had a disability, and he showed it showed her to the therapist. And the therapist, after she was she was quite a grown up girl, after a lot of examination, told her that. At her age, there was very little that they could do other than multiple surgeries. And even those, even that may or may not be successful. The father by then was at the end of his tether. He had nowhere else to go, nothing else he could find for the girl. He took her into the lady's toilet, strangled her, left her body there, and went away. This was his last hope when he came to a government institute. Fortunate, whether he planned it that way or not, we don't know. But by the end of the day, he was arrested because he'd left his papers behind, giving his name and address. And they found him before the end of that day. He was sitting by some, by the Jamuna River, crying. So this man had reached the end of his hopelessness. What could the society do for the girl was his question, as is your question. In a low resourced country, the options are very limited because of the priorities in the gender movement and the disability movement that I talked about. As you said also, the priorities are providing food, shelter, clothing. To actually economically and educationally rehabilitate them, we have to start very early. And you may not have seen too much happening for girls with disabilities at this age, stage in life. But once RPWD and MEP are actualized, then and these girls with disabilities, they come to our early intervention centers at the very, very early age. And I have worked with children who were half an hour old one hour old. So if we start very, very, very early intervention for them, starting at birth or soon thereafter, so fayda bahut hoga, and their life ahead through education and rehabilitation, starting at an age where they can actually make change, make change, initiate change, and sustain and maintain change, then that girl or that boy's life will be very, very, very much better. So institutions have been there, as I mentioned, from the beginning, and they continue to grow. But the concept now is independent living. For parents who can afford, they put their girls and boys into group homes, teach them independent skills. Like Mary Hatch, who fought against her parents and lived the way she wanted to live, that kind of empowerment of disabled girls in India, barring a few that I have mentioned and a few more who I have not mentioned, in rural areas, in semi-urban slum areas, these are difficult questions. And institutions don't have enough capacity to look after everybody. In fact, I want to end with this one comment that I remember. As I said, on behalf of the government of India, I would Ananto Akun Kutta Baran Kono. And the budget of Ananto Kore Dao, Hotao Akun Dashmini Pachmini Thang. I'm sorry, somebody started banging in the bathroom. So there was this, while I was representing government of India at the UNCRPD in New York, one girl who, and this was the first time that people with disabilities or the key stakeholders were allowed to participate in the negotiations and the discussions on the UN Convention. Earlier, they were not. And the UN building was simply not geared 
to women, to people with disabilities. It was not an accessible building. It was sometimes held in January and December, where the snow was very thick and wheelchairs could not negotiate that. So there was a lot of difficulties. One girl, I remember very clearly, she, they called themselves survivors of psychiatry. She was a lawyer, very bright lawyer, human rights lawyer. And she spoke brilliantly. And she actually, I think, changed the minds and mindsets of many people in that convention hall. She said she was forced by her family to live in an institution so that the rest of the family can take her share of the property. And when she was in the universe, in the institution, the dietitian told her, you can have toffee. And she said, what is toffee? So she said, the institution people said, well, some people like coffee. Some people like tea. So we mix the two and we serve it as toffee. Would you have that toffee? Anybody here answer me. Put it in the chat box. Would you have something like that served to you? Toffee, mixture and tea and coffee? You won't. I can guarantee that. And with that, I end my presentation. And the next speaker will have arrived, Sunita Shishadri. I want to thank Nipmed, especially Rajesh, for letting me participate in this program. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you so much, Mark, for the most informative and valuable session. Hope the participants learned a lot. And uh, so shall we come to the session? Yes, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, Aloka, ma'am, for coming and sharing your experiences. Thank you so much. Uh, I've just sent a mail for you to share the PPT, ma'am. So if you, after uh, leisurely, you can send the PPT, ma'am, and we will compile it. Thank you. Thank you. So dear participants, uh, we'll just, uh, uh, yes, Anthony, you can go ahead. Thank you, sir. So thank you, ma'am, once again. And uh, dear participants, next session will start by shout 11.30 p.m. It's 11.30 a.m. Uh, don't leave the session. Don't leave the session, just 15 minutes. Okay, sir. <laughs>